I've called Make Room. I actually wrote, I said to, to Renee on the weekend, I said, you know, this message that I'm going to share, I actually wrote like four years ago and I've never, I've never shared it. I wrote it and the opportunity that I was preparing for it, it just didn't come. It's just, it didn't happen. And so I've had it just kind of stuck in my back pocket for, for some time. And then after coming back uh, from the trip and looking at the calendar, I thought, you know what, this this is, this, is the, this is the Sunday, this is the time that I want to pull this out. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to dive right in. Turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 4. If you're not familiar with your Bible, it's near the beginning of the book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. I skip, I skip them. Joshua, Judges. 1 2 Samuel and then 1 2 Kings. What? I don't know the song. If you ever try and remember something that's kind of important to remember in front of a crowd of people, good luck. Like the books of the Bible or someone's name. One time I was I was speaking and I was telling a story about our worship leader. And then in the front of the entire church, I forgot her name. And she had just been on stage and I, I froze. And I was like, and I'm scanning because I know she's sitting somewhere. And then someone called out her name. I'm like, oh, it was the worst. Trying to remember something on the spot. Second Kings chapter four, we're gonna look at verses eight all the way through to 37. I'm not gonna read because it's a, it's a huge portion of scripture and it encompasses the entire story that I wanna look at. Uh, the story of the Shunammite woman um, I'm only going to read bits and pieces, um, but I'll, I'm going to, if you're not familiar with the story, I'm going to share enough and read enough that you'll be able to put the entire story together. But for time's sake, I'm not going to read uh, the, the entire portion of scripture. So I'm going to read a little bit at, at a time. We're going to start in uh, verse number eight. It says, now there came a day when Elisha passed over to Shunem, where there was a prominent woman and she persuaded him to eat food. And so it was. As often as he passed by, he turned in there to eat food. She said to her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God passing by us continually. Please let us make a little walled up chamber and let us set a bed for him there and a table and a chair and a lampstand. And it shall be when he comes that he can turn in there. The Shunammite saw the man of God and she persuaded him. She convinced him to come and spend some time with her and her husband. And she provided a place of rest for him, gave him food, brought him home for dinner. She served him. She gave him this place for rest. And it became a regular stopping place for Elisha as he traveled. Every time he was in Shunem, the Shunammite woman would prepare a meal for him and give him a place of rest. And she not only cooked for him, she not only gave him that place of rest, but she created a place within her house that was his. She put an addition on to her house. And the addition, if you read further on into the story, is actually on the roof of their house so that Elisha would have a place to stay, a resting place. In the Old Testament, what I'll refer to as the other side of the cross that's uh, pre, pre Jesus, pre uh, the resurrection. We are on this side. We'll call that the other side of the cross. So in the Old Testament, God's presence rested and remained largely in the Holy of Holies at the temple. There were people that were anointed to accomplish specific tasks and, and, and assignments for the Lord. And there were people that were anointed by God to do things, to live out a calling or a mandate. Most of these people were typically prophets. On this side of the cross, we are all anointed. First John tells us that we have an anointing from the Holy One because we are now the temple of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. Paul says, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? So God lives on the inside of us. When we come into relationship with Jesus, He takes up His residence on the inside of us. To be anointed literally means to be smeared with the presence of God. So Elisha was an anointed man of God. Elisha was smeared with the presence of God. And when we look at the anointing in that way, in that light, as being smeared with the very presence of God, what the Shunammite woman did was made room for the presence of God in her house. She made room for the anointing of God in her life. 
I want to ask you this morning, will you make room for the presence of God in your personal life? What are you willing to personally invest or what are you willing to personally sacrifice to make room for the manifestation of the presence of God in your life? And you might say, well, well, Craig, you just said that, that we all have an anointing from God. And you, you referenced 1 John, said that we are, we are smeared with, with the presence of God and we are now the home, the resting place of the presence of God. But how many people know that there's a difference between having God living on the inside and then making room for him? in your life. There's a difference. It's, it's, it's not the same. The same, it's, it's, it's like this. God is everywhere all the time. He's omnipresent. There's nowhere that God is not. But there's a, definitely a difference between God being everywhere all the time and in those moments like we had in worship when he lets you know that he's there. There's a difference. As a Cross Point Life family, we've made room for the presence of God. We've made it a priority in our gatherings when we gather together collectively. We stop following our agenda for the day when we sense that Holy Spirit is doing something or going in a different direction. We, we stop what we're doing. We don't, we don't really... Um, it, the decision to follow Holy Spirit is not, is not deterred by our convenience or our time factor because He is more important than our convenience. He's more important than, than, than our time. And we've... we've um, as, a, as a family, we have sacrificed, we have paid the price to follow Holy Spirit in our services, in our gatherings. Pastors Barry and Candy have made the presence of God a, prior, a priority in this family for years. And over the years, there's been a cost to making the presence of God a priority because there's lots of people that say that, that they want to experience the presence of God and they want that to be a priority in their lives. But when it, when it starts to happen... They're not willing to, to, to pay the price. They're not willing to. And so they leave. There's a, there's a price to be paid. But the presence of God cannot just be a priority in our collective gatherings, in our corporate gatherings, when we come together on Sundays or special meetings. It can't just be a priority here when we gather together. It has to be a priority in our personal lives. Because what we experience collectively is connected to what we do personally. See, when we place a high priority in our personal lives to encountering the presence of God, from making room for the presence of God personally, when we are not all gathered together, then when we gather together, there's an increase that comes. Because we have made the presence of God a priority personally, we're going to see an increase when we come together collectively. So today I want to encourage and I want to challenge us to make a personal decision, to pay the price and to make room for the presence of God in your personal life, in your private life. Whatever the cost, Jesus is worth it. He's always worth it. It, never, it doesn't matter whatever he asks you to give up, whatever he asks you to do, it doesn't matter how valuable that thing seems to you, Jesus is worth it. The presence of God rests on and with those that make room for him. Elisha didn't move around from house to house when he was in Shunem. He stayed with the Shunammite woman and her husband because she made the anointing, she made the presence of God a priority for her. Now when you, when you, when you make the anointing, when you make the presence of God a priority in your personal life, then you're going to open yourself up to ridicule because people are not going to understand what it is that you're doing. The same way that, that as a church, that there's been times that we've been, as a Crosspoint family, have opened ourselves up to ridicule because we have made the presence of God a priority and people have not understood what it was that we were doing. The Shunammite woman was childless. And it says in verse 8 that she was a prominent or a great woman in her community. So everybody knew this woman. Everybody knew her because she was prominent, she was well-known, and everybody knew her situation because when you're well-known and you're childless, you can't hide that. What do you think people began to think when they saw the addition being placed on the top of their house? See, homes in this day and age have flat roofs. And so when you stood out and looked across the city, 
you saw everybody, everybody looked the same. All the roofs were flat. They all looked the same. And then all of a sudden over here on this side, what are they doing over there? What are they putting on top of their house? That's the, that's, that's that, the Shunammite woman, that's her house. What is she doing? Why can't she just look like everybody else? Why does she have to stand out like that? Why can't she just blend in? What did people think when she rolled into the local market and she began to buy a bed and she was looking for a lamp and she was shopping for a table, pillows? They're like, woman, what on earth are you and your husband doing? You've got this thing on the top of your house. You're buying all of this stuff. You're childless. It's just the two of you. What are you doing? You have no need of extra space. Why can't you just be like the rest of us? Why are you so weird? Why don't you build a normal house like everyone else? Why can't you just sing three songs, take an offering, have a 20 minute message, and then we can all go home in an hour? Why can't you be like all the other churches? Why can't you just come out and, 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 and you know, roll, roll with the boys? Why, why don't you go up for nights on the town? Why don't you go clubbing? Why aren't, you, why aren't you spending all of your money, all of, all of the excess on, on, on toys and, and, and then heading out and, and just, why can't you just be like everybody else? Why are you so weird? Why do you get up so early on a Sunday morning and, and go off? Why don't you, what are you doing in your house? Crosspoint, you don't look like other churches. I hope you realize that. When you decide to become a part of this family, you, you didn't join a family that looks like all the other churches. So don't act like all the other believers. Pursue the things that others are not. Listen, this is available for everybody, but not everybody pursues it. Right? God doesn't just reserve his presence and, and, and intimacy with him for, for a select few. It's available for everybody, but not everybody takes, takes the time, makes room in their life for his presence. Make room for the presence of God in your private life. Stand out. Be different. People won't understand. They will whisper. They will talk. Your friends, your family members, they won't get you. But let them talk. Because you'll get what they won't. See, the Shunammite woman had what no one else did because she did what no one else would. She made room for the presence of God. Look at verse 15. Elisha's in, you know, this, this is the setup. Elisha's at the Shunammite woman's house. He's up on the rooftop in his room. He says to his servant to call the Shunammite woman. He said, call her. And when he called her, she stood in the doorway. Then he said, at this season, next year, you will embrace a son. And she said, no, no, my Lord, O man of God, do not lie to your maidservant. And the woman conceived and bore a son at that season, the next year, as, Eli as Elisha said that she would. The Shunammite woman was, she was content serving the anointing, making room for the presence of God. She rather enjoyed the inconvenience of hosting God, hosting, hosting the anointing, hosting the man of God. She enjoyed that inconvenience. But there was more for her that God had than just simply hosting the presence of God. Elisha wanted to know what could be done for her, but she's like, I'm, I'm happy with my life. I'm good. I don't need anything. See, many people, they are thrilled and excited to have God show up and blow up their meetings from time to time. He comes, people encounter him, they get whacked. Sometimes people, you know, they, they, they cry, they, they, they lay out on the floor and, and they, they have these dramatic encounters. They receive revelation and their, their, their lives are changed and transformed. It's, it's, it's glory, it's signs and wonders and it's miracles. And people, are, they're excited to have that from time to time. But God has more than just the warm fuzzy for you when we gather together. There's a place, whether you realize it or not, there's a place inside each and every one of us that's longing for more. 
wherever you are in your walk with God, where, however intimate you would say that you are, how long that you've walked with God, or what you've seen and experienced, or how much revelation you have you know, from, from, from the Bible, there's still more and there's a longing inside of you for more because you will never exhaust and reach the end of the presence of God. There's always something new and something fresh for you. So no matter where you are in your life, there's always that longing inside for more. Will you allow that longing to come out? Will you allow that longing to lead you and to pull you and to drive you into the presence of God? Or will you put a lid on it and be like, no, 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 no. I don't, I don't have time. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I've got plans. I've got, you know, I've got my five-year life plan. I'm, I'm, I'm working my goals. And I've, I, I just, I don't, have, I don't have time for that. The presence of God is for more than just a visitation. It's to bring transformation through habitation. Transformation in you and then transformation through you. So Elisha prophesies to the woman and says that she'll have a son the same time next year. Her response, this is great. Don't lie to me. Right? She knows who's in her house. She spent time with them. They've got a, they've got a relationship. There's, there's a friendship there. And he says this and she says, don't you lie to me. And I can just see her standing in the doorway and doing that. Don't you lie to me, Elisha. Don't you tease me. Don't you dare promise me something and then not come through. Something that I can't have. Family, God doesn't tease us. God doesn't lie. God doesn't overpromise and underdeliver. He's not like the rest of us. We do that all the time. We will overpromise on something and, and then we underdeliver. God never does that. When God promises you something, he means for you to have it. You can rule and you can reign in your inner private life not just in your inner private life, but in, but in the world, in your community, in your place of influence. You can see the kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We can see and experience citywide transformation and revival and reformation. We can see it. We can see California turn back to God. People have written California off that it's lost, but we can see it turn. You can have it, you can see it, you can experience because you've been shown trustworthy with the presence of God. Stewarding and serving the anointing. See, the, the Shunammite woman, she created a place of intimacy with the anointing, with the presence of God. Shunam actually means double resting place. The child that she was promised, the promise, the miracle came from a place of intimacy with the presence of God. Look at verse 18. It says, When the child was grown, the day came that he went out to his father, to the reapers. He goes out into the field and they're harvesting. And he said to his father, My head, my head. And so he said to his servant, Carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her lap until noon and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door behind and went out. And then she called to her husband and said, please send me one of the servants and one of the donkeys that I may run to the man of God and return. The Shunammite woman has her son as, as promised and has him for many years. It's not like it's the very next year. There's, he's old enough to go out and work with his father in the field and with the harvesters. And so the child has grown and he goes out to work with his father and he develops a pain in, in his head. He goes home to his mother only to die in her arms. What do you do when the promise doesn't turn out the way that it was supposed to? God promised you something, he gave you a prophetic word, and then you see it, you can wrap your hands around it, you can hold it, you're experiencing it. And then something isn't right. What do you do? You do what the Shunammite woman did. You go to the anointing. You lean in and you seek the Father's face. 
That's what this represents. That's what her trip to Elisha represented. She was going to the presence of God. Without hesitation, she packs up and she journeys to Elisha to go and find him. The answers and the breakthrough and the miracles and the reformation and the revival, it's all found in the presence of God. It's all found in intimacy with the Father. So when things in your life, the things that have been prophesied, the things that have been promised, the things that you're holding on to, when they go sideways, then you go straight to God. Right? When things in your life, when it goes south, then you go straight up to the presence. When things go sour, then you go to the sweet place of intimacy with God. You don't sit down. Like she could have just sat there with her son in her arms and wept and mourned and, and just and fell apart. And just sat in it. But she knew that that wasn't going to fix anything. That wasn't going to solve anything. All the answers that we're looking for, it's all found in the intimate place of the presence of God. So she left to go find Elisha. And I love the statements of faith that she makes as she goes. Her only son, the promise just died and she tells her husband in verse 23 who by the way when you read the story is completely unaware that anything is happening you know his his only son has has this incredible pain in his head he sends him off with this with his servant to go back to his mother and now the mother's leaving the son is still nowhere to be found and and like dad is completely clueless hey like where are you going why are you going to see Elisha and this is what she says it is well it is well. Now, it's obviously not well. Her child just died in her arms. Things are not okay. But she began to speak life over that dead promise. She could have spoke about how tragic it was and how horrible it was and what a great loss that it was. But, you know, that's the... Why are you going to see Elisha? Oh my goodness, like our son died. Like she could have just spilled her guts. It is well. And she begins speaking life and faith over the dead promise. Proverbs tells us that the power of life and death are in the tongue. So then do we speak life or do we speak death over our troubles? Listen, we don't deny, it's like, we do not deny the reality of whatever it is that we're experiencing, whatever it is that we're walking through. That's not what I'm saying. It's not like you close a blind eye, you know, like I, I broke a leg, my leg's not broken. I can still walk. It's clearly broken. You know, it's, it's not ignoring the reality of this situation, but it's choosing to speak life over that reality and holding on to the greater reality that Scripture talks about. See, the unseen realm, the realm of the kingdom of God, the supernatural realm, is a greater realm than what we see. So there's things that exist that are greater than this table and the chair that you're sitting on. Those are real because you're sitting on it. You can touch it. And so we feel like this is the greatest reality because I can hold this cup and there's water in my cup, but there's a greater reality than what I hold in my hand. It's the supernatural realm. And that's what the Shunammite woman tapped into. She wasn't ignoring the fact that her only child had just died in her arms. She was speaking life and holding on. It is well. It was a faith statement about what was about to happen what she was believing for. Verse 29. The Shunammite woman had met up with, with Elisha and they had a conversation and this is what Elisha says. He says to Gehazi, which is his servant, gird up your loins and take my staff in your hand and go your way. If you meet any man, do not salute him. And if anyone salutes you, do not answer him. And you lay my staff on the lad's face. So after hearing that the boy has died, Elisha sends his servant with his staff to lay across the boy's face. Seems to me as I read this story that Elisha is only partially committed. He's only partially invested in the potential of the situation. Elisha sends his staff to try and resurrect the boy. He wasn't fully committed. How often do we half commit to releasing the presence of God and and, and faith in the miraculous in a situation? Why is it? Have you ever wondered and questioned yourself or or questioned with the Lord, God, why don't I step out more? Why, what is it that's in me that I don't take, you know, greater risks of faith and trust you more? Why, Why are we afraid Really, why, why don't we always take God at his word? Why do we question what we read and what he tells us is available for us? 
See, through, it's through intimacy with God that we unlock the promise that Jesus gives in John chapter 14 and verse 12 where he tells us that we can do all the things that he did. Jesus had an intimate relationship with the Father. He saw in the spirit realm what the Father was doing and then he went out and he, he went out and he did the same things. You and I, we're no different. True, we are not the Messiah. We are not the Son of God. That's, that's not us. But we have access to the same intimacy that Jesus did because Jesus is the door. Jesus is the access point. Jesus is the gate to the Father. And we can't, ever, when, we, when we read through the Gospels and you read about the things that Jesus did and how he lived his life, we can't ever, not ever, not once read that and think, well, that's, that's Jesus. Of course he did that. Because Jesus, God in the flesh, set aside all of his, all of his, his, um, his rights and his privileges as God, set aside his deity, restricted himself to the limitations as man, and he lived his life as man, with all the same restrictions and limitations that we have. Jesus ate, Jesus drank, he got hungry and thirsty, he got tired, he had to walk around, play, to get all these things because he was, he was a man. He lived his life as a man. See, because if he did all of these things that we read about in the scripture, and then he says in John 14 and 12, you can do the same things, but he did them as God, then that's just a cruel joke because you cannot do the same things as God because you're not God. See, but Jesus didn't do them as God. He did them as a man. He set aside his deity and all the rights and the privileges that, that, and the power that came with that and he restricted himself to live as a man. So doing all the things that we read in the Gospels as a man, Jesus is showing us what is possible when we live lives of intimacy with the Father. He says, this is what's possible when you live with intimacy, when you live a yielded, submitted life to the Father. Sometimes we look at situations and we're afraid to get involved because we're afraid that nothing's going to happen. Well, I don't want to look silly. I don't, want to, I don't want to pray for you know financial miracle when, when, you know, when my coworker's on the edge of bankruptcy and then nothing happened and they lose everything. Then they're going to look at me and be like, where's your God now? We don't want to look crazy, so what we do is we send the staff. Well, what if, what if, what if nothing happens? What if... So we, throw up, we just throw up a prayer. We hear about a situation and we don't actually engage. We, 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 you know, symbolically send the staff and we go over here and we say, Jesus, bless them, provide for them. But we don't say any, we don't actually get involved. We just throw up a prayer. God, if it's your will, would you please intervene? See, we're not committed. We're not invested. We haven't taken the risk, which means we haven't stepped out in faith. We're just, we're just tossing up prayers. Like Elisha, we send the staff saying, here's a little prayer for my school. Here's a little prayer for my job and for my coworkers and for my, for my family. Here's a little prayer for healing. Here's a prayer so that, you know, so-and-so will get saved. Here's a little prayer for revival. Here's, 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 a, here's a prayer for my city, but I'm not actually going to get involved. I'm not going to get too, you know, too out there. Listen, we're not called to pray from a distance. We're not called to, to pray like, like some kind of drive-by shooter. Just We drive by a situation and we, we shoot prayers out, pshoo, 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 and we just keep going. Nobody even knows that you were there, but you shot prayers out the window. Pshoo, pshoo. That's, not, that's not what God has for us. We've been called to get involved. You were called to stop for the one, to get personally invested, to take risks of faith. We are called, listen, we are called to stretch ourselves out and to look eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth with the situation and call forth awakening. Look at verse 32. It says, when, when Elisha came to the house, behold, the lad was dead and he was laid on his bed. So he entered and he shut the door behind them and prayed to the Lord. And he went up and he lay across the child and he put his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes, his hands on his hands and he stretched himself on him and the flesh of the child became warm. And then he returned and he walked back in the house back and forth, back and forth and went up and stretched himself on him. 
And the lad sneezed seven times, and the boy opened his eyes. Elisha, fully committed, went in, and he went in person. And he stretched himself out on the boy, and he was eye to eye, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, and hand to hand. He was looking death in the face. He was, he, this, this is the death of a dream. This is the death of a promise. This is, he, he's staring it straight in the face. Now he's involved. Now he's, now he's committed. See, this is, where, this, this is a picture of, of where God is calling us to be, to get involved, to be committed. We are called to risk. We are called to step out. We are called to see the greater reality of the invisible kingdom of God and bring it to our natural reality. So Elisha prays. He locks in with heaven, stretched out across the boy, and the boy becomes warm. No resurrection, but it's not nothing. See, something has began to happen because he's, he's still dead, but now he's warm. And so Elisha doesn't go, well, you know, it's a little something. Sometimes these things take a little while. It's progressive, so I'm going to go and we'll, we'll check in on you later. He gets up, and he starts pacing back and forth in the room, back and forth in the room. He's, he's, he's continuing to lock in with the Father and what, and what God wants to do here. And he stretches himself out one more time across him. Listen, don't give up. Don't you ever give up. Don't you ever give up on your promise, on your prophetic word, on your dream, on your destiny. Listen, to an extent, I don't care what, what it looks like now. Don't you ever give up how bleak it is, how dark it is, how bad it is, how painful it is, how hard you've been, like how bad you've been wounded. Don't you ever give up. You just, time and time again, if you may have laid across your situation, that dead promise, four, four or five times, stared it eye to eye, and you begin to call out life and resurrection and awakening over that thing, and nothing has happened, then do it one more time. Just do it one more. How many more times am I supposed to do that? Just do it one more time. Just do it one more time. Don't you ever give up. We're not called to give up. We're not called to quit. We're called to pray, to lock in with heaven, to release awakening. To speak life and faith. Continue to press into the place of intimacy. Continue to seek, and to pray. Just don't ever give up. Pastor, I don't know what I'm supposed to say anymore. Then don't, don't pray with your mind. Just pray with your spirit. Use your spiritual prayer language. Pray in tongues over your situation. There's many times I have no idea what to pray. So most of the time I don't pray in English. I just walk around and I pray in tongues because I have no idea what to pray. And I just trust that it's the Spirit of God praying through me and He knows what He's doing. So I'm just going to partner with Him in that. Don't ever give up. Don't you ever give up. You are the answer to someone's prayer. You, you are the carrier of the anointed one and his anointing. Whenever in the gospels, whenever you read that, that word Christ, you know, Jesus Christ, that word Christ, that's what it means. The anointed one and his anointing. The anointed one as, and his anointing. You are the carrier of the anointed one and his anointing. Do you understand that? That you carry the same anointing that Jesus carried. See, if we really understood, not just here, yeah, 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 I read it, I understand what you're saying, I hear you, I comprehend what you're saying, but if we get it here, so there's a different knowing here. The 18 inches between your head and your heart is far, it's probably the longest 18 inches ever, but there's a difference when you know it here, because when you know it here, then you act on it. Incredible things happen where the presence of God is. You can't explain it. You can't reason it. You just get to experience it. As followers of Jesus, we all carry God with us. He lives on the inside of us. He's here. He's with you. But will you make room for Him? As the Shunammite woman did, will you make room for Him? So the call this morning is towards intimacy. It's intimacy with God. It's intimacy with His presence. Intimacy like you've never known, like you've never experienced, like you've never heard about. He's calling you deeper. Wherever it is that you are, however you want to scale or graph and, or plot where you are in your relationship with God, he, He's got more. He wants to take you deeper. He wants you to know Him like He knows you. Will you make room for Him? 
That's the question this morning. Will you make room for the presence of God? As an individual, in your private life, not just when we come together collectively, but you. This is what I want to do this morning. I want to pray for those that have held on, have seen, have wrapped your arms around the promise, prophetic word, and literally just watched it slip through your fingers. And now it feels like it's dead. You receive the promise, and it feels like it died in your hands. And I feel like there's that there's more more than one, but. You know when you see you're, you're believing for something, you receive a prophetic word or that promise from Scripture, you feel like God has spoken to you and you are just energized with faith and you're like, yes, right? It's so hard as natural people because we, we, we have a really difficult time judging distance in the supernatural realm. So we get a promise and we feel like it's right there. Like I can reach, I can touch, it's gonna happen right now. But we, we don't have, we, we can't judge distance in the spirit realm. And so we, there's this moment in time where we receive a promise, we receive a prophetic word, we are energized with faith and we are believing and praying and holding on to that. And then the days start to pass and then the months start to pass and then the years start to pass and you're all the way over here and it seems like forever ago that you received the prophetic word and you received the promise and you're like, well, I guess, I guess it just wasn't meant to be. I guess the, the, the promise died. You see, the, the farther we get away from it, it seems like the less faith that we have. But that's not the way that it's supposed to work. Because we're, we're turning around and we're looking at the, back in the moment in time when we received the prophetic word, we received the promise, and we should be looking forward to having it and holding it in our hand. See, because the farther I, I am away from that, the closer I am to this. See, this is, this is the secret of Abraham. When he was told that he would have a son, it says that, you read in Romans, that he grew stronger. He grew, he grew stronger as the days and months and years went, went by because I, he realized he was one day closer. I'm one day closer to seeing my miracle. I'm one day closer to holding that promise in my hand. I'm one day closer to seeing the fulfillment of that prophetic word. See, that's where we need to be. But our emotions get in there and we get disappointed and disillusioned and we get discouraged. And so if you're here this morning and you feel like, you know, that's me. I've got, I've got some promises and prophetic words that I feel I've literally, I feel like they just, they died in my hands. Then I want, I want you to stand. Because this morning we're going we're gonna to get personally invested as a family. We're going to look you in the eye and we're going to call out life and we're going to call out awakening and we're going to call out resurrection over those dead promises and those prophetic words that you feel like they've, they've gone. They're not gone. They're not, they're not dead. We're speaking life over them. And, it, and if you've done this countless times before and you say, yeah, yeah, I've been there. I've done that. You know, just one more time. Just one more time. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. Because that's the only way that you're not going to see the, 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 the promise come to pass is if you give up. Because God's committed, he's all in. And so if we don't give up, then we will see the promise. We will see the, 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 the prophetic word come to pass. So family, if you're near someone who's standing, just reach out, lay, lay a hand on them. And just begin to call out life and awakening over them. Go ahead. Just speak life to prophetic promises. Speak life to dreams, to prophetic words. We call forth awakening in Jesus' name. We call forth awakening over the dead promise. Those things that we feel have, have they just slipped right through our fingers. There was a time when I was holding on to it, when I was seeing it, when I, when I could touch it and wrap my arms around it. I held it in my arms and it literally died on my lap. In the name of Jesus, I declare, awake now in Jesus' name. I speak life over those promises that we feel are long gone, that we feel are dead and buried. In the name of Jesus, life and the resurrection power of Christ flow through you and through your dreams and those prophetic words and those promises that you're holding on to and we refuse to give up 
We call out life and resurrection and awakening in Jesus' name. We release the presence of God. We release the anointing of God that rests on us and in us over these promises and over these prophetic words. And we call them in the name of Jesus to awake. I declare the fire of God to fall upon your promises and your prophetic words and your dreams. Those things that are stone cold dead now begin to become warm in Jesus' name. Fire of God fall in Jesus' name. And Father, we see, we see into the spirit realm the reality of those promises and dreams and prophetic words fulfilled and we hold on to them. And we continue, commit to continue to calling out life and awakening over them in the name of Jesus. We declare the goodness of God over your people. I pray that the deep things of God will call to the deep in us and would draw us into the place of intimacy. That we would be known not just as a church that makes room for the presence of God, but we would be known as people that make room for the presence of God. Take us to the deep places, Father. Take us to the deep places. In Jesus' name. <laughs>